Hey everyone, it's Dr. Namani and Dr. Louie back again today with the Athlete Spine, and we're really excited to have our guest today, Dr. Ben Wachuku from Hospital for Special Surgery, where he is an associate attending um, at the uh, in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at HSS, as well as an associate professor of orthopedic surgery at Wild Cornell Medical Center, where he is also the director of lower extremity research. Uh, ben and I have a, a very close connection uh, in the sense that uh, Dr. Nwachuku was my junior resident at HSS, where I was also a resident. So uh, it's it's um, uh, an honor and a privilege to have you here today. Thank you very much. Uh, the privilege and the honor is all mine. I'm excited um, to uh, share a little bit more about what I do with uh, with you and your audience. Yeah, and uh, and those are not the only hats that uh, Dr. Nwachuku wears, actually. So tell us a little bit about the other, the, some of the sports teams you're involved in and this company that you helped start during uh, COVID. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things I, I love about medicine is just the opportunity to, you know, be involved in, in many parts of uh, medicine, whether that's, you know, direct uh, access and direct care of patients or taking care of professional sports teams. So I've had the privilege to take care of the Brooklyn Nets and the New York Liberty. So you know, I, I'm involved in taking care of those teams. And then during the pandemic, um, I, I basically sought the opportunity to use my business training to start a company um, connecting patients with some of the top providers um, in orthopedics, as well as many medical specialties. My goal is to revolutionize how people access care and to break down some of the barriers and silos to healthcare access. Yeah, that's really awesome. And I think that the pandemic for many was like an opportunity to innovate and you certainly took advantage of that. And it's been really fun to see sort of that avenue of your work growing too, but we're bringing you on for a different reason today. Um, you're not necessarily involved directly with the spine like we are, but certainly within the orthopedic sports realm. Uh, but there's this big concept that we talk about called the hip spine syndrome, and we see it all the time, uh, but people may not know what that is. And, and you deal with that a lot. So um, what exactly is that and sort of what sort of athletes do you see that in? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's really an evolving area that, we un that we're understanding as it connects to the hip and the spine. Um, I would say that hip spine syndrome has been really defined since around 2016, 2017. And any word that has syndrome in it uh, refers to a collection of problems um, spanning across multiple disease states. And so specific to hip spine syndrome, um, that really refers to people who have coexisting um, spine and hip problems. So in my day job as you know, a hip preservation uh, surgeon, I oftentimes will see people who have uh, both hip pain as well as back pain or people who um, present to me with hip pain who've had a history of um, back surgery. And so um, would like to uh, take a minute uh, without boring you to just explain the uh, pathophysiology of how the hip and the spine are interrelated. And so, you know, specific to the young athlete who has hip spine syndrome, it oftentimes will stem from femoral acetabular impingement or FAI. And that really is as a result of a mechanical conflict between the ball and the socket of the hip. And it results in less range of motion in the hip joint. Um, and that's colloquially known as a cam deformity, where it's essentially like putting a square peg in a round hole. And so what happens when you don't have as much range of motion in the hip is that then the spine has to compensate for that range of motion. Remember, the spine and the pelvis are one unit, one motion segment. And so the sum of the motion um, is still one. And so if there's no motion in the hip, then the spine has to get more motion. Now, there's a certain normal range of motion of the spine. And when the spine gets overworked, that can lead to problems like disc herniations or uh, a rapid rate of degenerative disease of the lumbar spine. And so commonly, I'll see patients who come in with FAI um, who have had a history of uh, single level disc herniation, oftentimes at L3, L4, L4, L5, or will have degenerative disc disease of the lumbar spine that is more advanced than their age. And those people are the people that I identify as having um, hip spine syndrome. Yeah, I, I think it's a it's a really interesting concept. And like you said, you know, this we're still kind of in the early stages of really understanding it. But I think that the key concept which you highlighted here is that I think people intuitively understand that our body is linked together, right? You can't think of body parts in isolation and and disease states that affect one part of the body, in this case the hip or the spine 
can easily affect those adjacent to it. And so, um, you know, whenever we have patients that aren't recovering as expected or are, um, are having other issues going on, I think it's very important that we uh, step outside our little soapbox, us as spine surgeons um, and, and other types of doctors and think about the other body parts uh, around the areas that are affected that could be contributing to someone not being able to get back to function or return to sport like we think they should be. That's right. And you know, that's one of the reasons why I really like what I do is that it's really a multidiscipl multidisciplinary affair. So, you know, I work with spine surgeons, I work with physiatrists, um, you know, because we essentially co-treat um, our patients uh, very commonly. And so it, you can't just focus on the hip. You have to think about the spine. And similarly, you can't just treat the spine. You have to think about the impact of the hip on, on the uh, spine. And we talk about upstream and downstream effects. And so, you know, for the hip, I consider the spine to be upstream and for the um, and downstream would be the knee. Um, you know, there was an interesting study actually published in the NFL where they found that um, people who had FAI had six times an increased risk of rupturing their ACL. Again, related to the lack of motion of the hip and increased compensation of motion um, through the knee, leading to poor landing mechanics and increased risk of ACL ruptures. Yeah, it's inter interconnectedness. You know, we talk about this with our patients all the time, right? You know, when you have a, you know, a spine injury or, or a disc injury, oftentimes you can lose a little bit of motion at that segment. And so how do you best compensate for trying to perform a lot of your daily activities or even like your sporting activities? You compensate for your hips uh, more so than your knees. And, and so there certainly is a lot of interconnectedness. And I think that one self have been an author and a researcher in a lot of these studies that have looked at outcomes following both spine surgeries and written a lot more so in hip surgeries in that when you have problems in the other, it can impact the outcomes of what you're operating on, um, especially in these athletic populations. So one of my questions for you is, so, so how exactly do you differentiate between the two? Or so like when you're examining a patient that comes in, they've gotten injured or they've gone through something, and this is a younger patient, of course, um, how do you start parsing this out in your head? How, what are you asking? How are you examining them? How do you piece this all together? Yeah, I think it starts with a good history, trying to understand, you know, is which came first? Um, what is the primary complaint? Um, you know, oftentimes you will hear something like, you know, I've always had tight hips. And so they may not have pain um, in the hips, but, you know, the hip has always had a decreased range of motion. So in that situation, you'll know that it's something that's been going on for some time. Um, and then a tool that I actually consider to be very helpful, especially for people with uh, hip pathology, is the diagnostic injection. So oftentimes I will inject the hip. Um, there's been a movement away from injecting with corticosteroids. So I'll inject with lidocaine, um, ultrasound guided lidocaine injection in the office. Um, and then I'll move the hip around. And oftentimes, uh, some of these patients will tell me that their hip moves more freely and that their back pain even gets better. And, you know, we've seen in the literature that when you address uh, hip impingement, um, 85 percent of patients who have uh, back pain who have not had prior back surgery, um, their back pain can get better. I think one of the other things um, uh, that, that you mentioned that uh, is, is really, really important that you, that you touched on is the importance of a multidisciplinary team, you know, so uh, when, when something doesn't quite fit, you, uh, you know, rely on, on your team consisting of not only uh, yourself, but the physiatrists, which are the non-surgical musculoskeletal doctors, uh, as well as spine surgeons to try to all come together and, and have the collective minds figuring out what's, uh, what's best, uh, the the best way to take care of a particular patient. Yeah, I'm, I'm a really huge fan of the multidisciplinary conferences. So, you know, it's similar to the way that, um, you know, in at cancer centers, they'll, they will present, you know, patients with complex tumors. Um, you know, I like to have uh, patients who have hip spine syndrome presented at, you know, our hip preservation conferences, you know, where there's physiatrists present, non-operative sports medicine doctors, hip surgeons, spine surgeons, physical therapists where everyone can opine and basically get a sense of what's going on. You know, because sometimes a patient can tell you that they, you know, have been doing physical therapy, but maybe they haven't been therapy. Maybe they haven't 
um, you know, been focused on addressing uh, glute dysfunction or, um, you know, hip flexor uh, tightness, right? Or maybe their therapy has been focused on the lower back, but not the hip, et cetera. And so understanding where there's been a breakdown um, in the therapy and areas that you can potentially address. Yeah. And I mean, that's something we've been hammering home in our recent episodes. Is that it, it, it can take a village to care for some of these athletes and some of these patients because so much is at stake sometimes with their ability to return uh, to their activities. Um, you, know, I, you know, we thank you so much for coming on with us today. Uh, this is sort of a fun topic that a lot of people don't talk about often because people just don't know. Um, you know, from the spine side and from the hip side, you know, do you, do you have one big takeaway or, or one key point that uh, you can tell your audience as to what to pay attention for? Because a lot of people may have sort of this type of pathology or this type of pain, and it's it's really hard to differentiate. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that in, in general, as a takeaway, don't shy away from back pain. If you are a, um, you know, person who is treating uh, the young athlete, um, you know, previously, I think back pain was sort of a, a black box. And if an athlete had, um, you know, back pain, it would be a prognosticator of either poor outcomes or progression to, um, you know, further interventions, whether that's a fusion or what have you. Um, I would say that um, we have better treatments for back pain through um, interventions that your colleagues have made where there are less invasive options, but also through understanding the multifactorial causes of back pain, understanding that, you know, potentially back pain may not be coming from the back. It may have its root um, in the hip. And so you can actually address back pain um, if you actually embrace it and try to understand the root cause. Well, Dr. Nwachuku, thanks again so much for, for coming on with us. I think this has been really educational and, uh, you know, we've, uh, we're still early in this field. And so, um, we expect to have, uh, another episode with you in another couple of years, you know, with all the new developments in this area. So, uh, until next time, thanks again. It's been uh, great having you all, um, uh, be sure to like and subscribe and follow us on Instagram and um, uh, as well as uh, uh, follow Dr. Nwachuku on his social media account. So until next time, thanks everyone. All right, take care.